What's really interesting, I think, is that Jesus has a lot to say about money. We think about Jesus being very heady and, and all these things being very spiritual that, that come from Jesus. But Jesus is very concerned about this kind of day-to-day -day money handling of the household economy kind of stuff. Now, he doesn't have a lot to say about marriage. And that's maybe because marriage is in that day a contractual agreement that's to provide security usually for a daughter. It's not usually about relationship, which is how we envision marriage now. But it's not usually, which seems kind of to, to be a big deal. Relationship is a real big deal for the only begotten of the Creator, from both of whom proceed the one who is our breath. Of course, Jesus also doesn't do a lot of delineation about his relationship with the Godhead either. Now this reading today is one of those few times that, that Jesus bothers saying something about marriage. But then again, this isn't really about marriage either. Not at its root. It's more about explaining how the Sadducees' argument is just fundamentally wrongheaded. It has no basis in the reality of God's eternal presence. These Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, come to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, we'll get in with this one. The law says that a woman has to be claimed by, which is what marriage is in this day, claimed by brother after brother of widowers if she doesn't manage to bear any sons on her own. Now, since more than one man can't own her, even though a man can own as many wives as he likes, that schema can't possibly work in some wild eternity in which they're all alive. I mean, since the law is, you know, the law, that disproves the existence of an eternity with God, doesn't it? To which Jesus says, that's a stupid argument. This is the best that you could come up with when you put your heads together to stump the God. Y'all are idiots. Would y'all take umbrage with God calling people idiots? Serpents, maybe? Would that one work? Or, or hypocrites? That'd be okay, but not idiots. Maybe that's just how God's deep sighs resound in my own head when I make stupid decisions. Oh, idiot. But this is about stewardship, right? So I wonder if I'm the only one who, when, when we have the, some of our events in which I, I bring my credit card and, and I bring my phone, but I don't bring any cash because I never, ever have cash with me, am I the only person who comes to, to events and to church services and, and whose, whose palms get sweaty and clammy and whose heart starts racing when the offering plate comes around? Or, or when somebody calls and asks for help with, with gas and power bills and rent and food, God, I can't help. We're, we're, we're in between paychecks. The car payment is due that the power bill went up again. I have student loans to pay off for the rest of my life and the next five. Everything is breaking. Everything needs repair. There's no way I can help. I'm, I'm strapped. But that's fear, isn't it? That's not faith. Now, I guess a dangerous place that we could go with this discourse, of course, is, is this. If, if a final destination in eternity, in its presence, is our goal, what does it matter what happens here? What does it matter how we invest? I mean, even what does it matter if, if I stand up here and ramble at you for 15 or, or 20 minutes? 
am I just wasting my breath? Am, am I offering any sort of, of transformation, any sort of hope, any sort of salvation? If God's going to wipe this world out and replace it with glory, who cares? Or am I just standing up here begging you for money? You know, the bottom line when it comes to money is, is that you put your treasure where your heart is. Where you put your treasure defines your values. So is this place and the ministry that we offer important to you? If it is, well then you invest in it. You put your money where your, your, your mouth is. The other comment that I'd offer you regarding money is that our theology of tithing is pretty ill-founded. It's not a real weak foundation. It's based on Abram's encounter with, with Melchizedek. I really love that name. It's based on that encounter in, in about four verses of the 14th chapter of Genesis. It goes like this. After his return, that is Abram's return, from the defeat of Kedolaomer and the kings who were with him. That's a tricky word. I'm not real sure about that name. And I'll just admit that to you. I just say it with boldness. If you're ever up here or in any sort of, with any sort of audience, and you have a name, especially out of the Bible, that you're not real comfortable with, say it with confidence, and no one will know the difference. After his return from the defeat of Kedaliomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. That's it. That is the foundation of our theology of tithing. And what does that have to do with us? Is it that if Abram shows thankfulness in a big expression of generosity like that, we should be so thankful to God for giving us everything that keeps us going every day and we should respond like that? Is that how this goes? You know, Jesus doesn't say, give me a tenth. Jesus says, lay down your life. Jesus says, take up your cross. Jesus doesn't expect 10%. Jesus expects everything. A tithe is a meager offering. But again, does it matter? Is what we do here important enough to offer everything? Or anything at all? Jesus seems to think so. And frankly, if you don't trust Jesus on this, then why are you here? I think that's a corollary of what Jesus is saying about God being God not of the dead but of the living. Not, not only is he arguing the existence and the nature of eternal life against the Sadducees, but if God is God of the living, then God is deeply concerned about what we do here, about how we fare. That is the consistent concern for the most vulnerable people in our communities. That's echoed in just about everything that Jesus does. That's echoed throughout the law and throughout the prophets. It's everywhere in our ancient texts. 
God cares how we treat each other. And so where we invest, again, defines what we care about. And I'm convinced that investing shows our faith in ways that God sees. God doesn't ignore how we invest in each other. God doesn't ignore how we neglect and mistreat each other either. God sees our ugliness and allows it to lead us into very ugly places. Thus, the exile. Which is what we find Haggai counseling the people out of today. Looking at the city and the raised temple, everything in ruins, and saying, who among you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it appear as nothing to you? Do those words ring with you? If they do, I invite you to hear these words of encouragement. So now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, high priest Joshua, Jehozadak's son. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heavenly forces. As with our agreement, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit stands in your midst. Don't fear. Don't fear. Work. Be strong. God is with us. God will not abandon our faithfulness and our investing in each other and in our community. God will lead us, leave us to our own devices. If we gossip, if we slander, if we neglect each other, if we undermine the important work that's being done, But God will be with us in our efforts. But God expects no less than everything we are. Everything we have. You know, we could afford to be meager a few generations ago when we were living in plenty. But y'all are paying attention to what's going on around you, right? We aren't living in a time of plenty. Not in our church, and not in our community. Humanity as a whole is outgrowing nature. Costs of living are climbing way beyond what used to be affordable. A dollar doesn't stretch so well anymore. We are moving deeply into a time of want. If it doesn't look like, it's because capitalism is just really good at covering it up. But the God of the living is urging us to invest. Invest all that you are. Exercise the kind of generosity that God exercises on us. And I'm convinced that that is when the Lord of heavenly forces says, in just a little while, I will make the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land quake. I will make all the nations quake. The wealth of the nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of heavenly forces. The silver and the gold belong to me, says the Lord of heavenly forces. This house will be more glorious than its predecessor, says the Lord of heavenly forces. I will provide prosperity in this place, says the Lord of heavenly forces. Of course, 
if the hope of prosperity is why you exercise your generosity, then you're doing it wrong. Do it because God cares. Do it because God is God of the living and calls us to care for the living enough to keep them from suffering and dying. I'm encouraging you to invest. I'm encouraging you to make a promise, to make a covenant. And I know it's hard to give. I know this is a hard promise to make. So does God. And God is more forgiving than the funding of our ministries is. You know what you need to do. You know what God is saying to you. Be faithful. How you live and how you give matters because God is God of the living. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.